that was not bad. It was great. Dear Lord, thank you for being God of life, and we are grateful that we have uh, individuals here that are still knowledgeable and helping us learn how not to die. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to be a guidance, and may we learn uh, how not to die. This is a very new thing to have. All right, so um, our little health series that we're going to be doing over the next three months is based on this book, How Not to Die. So that's where we got the title from. Uh, Dr. Michael Greger, um, this is a really good book. If anybody's read it or would like to read it, um, I've got a few copies. Uh, but we're going to talk the first week on How Not to Die from Hypertension. Then the second month will be how not to die from diabetes. Third month will be how not to die from depression. And depending on how things go <laughs> with that, um, we may continue it longer and do a longer series. Um, so this is kind of a trial to see how, how much everybody has interest in things. So uh, to get started, hypertension, the silent killer. Um, Next slide. Does everybody know what hypertension is de is defined as? Anybody? So top number is usually how well your heart contracts. Bottom number is how well it relaxes. So we call it systolic over diastolic. Um, hypertension is the a very common reason why people go to the doctor's office. Uh, about um, Half the people that take the medicines are still uncontrolled, and it's called a silent killer because people don't seem to care that they have it most of the time. Um, the, people come in and actually will tell me, oh, it's always fine at home. It's only, it's only high here. Um, or they'll say, I, uh, I take my medicine every day, and I can look at the prescription list on the pharmacy and say, you haven't filled it since last year. So how are you taking it every day? So it, it doesn't actually uh, hurt my feelings when people don't take pills. It actually hurts your health. So hypertension and learning about it is about how to control your own health um, because you're not hurting your doctors and you're not hurting them if you don't take your medicines. Can you it? not know what you Oh yes, that's why it's called the silent killer. So you can definitely have it and not be aware. So the, the problem with relying on feelings for anything is very dangerous. I mean, that's actually talked about in the Bible as well, about not believing your heart and how your heart can be deceitful. You can't rely on feelings because if you're just waiting for, oh, I feel fine, I'll just wait till I don't feel fine, it's too late. You've already got things already established. So that's a good question. Any other questions? Just stop me along the way because I'm not a I'm not a speaker usually, so <laughs> I don't like being up front. Um, so anyway, um, it is the most common reason people come in to see us: blood pressure, and they don't usually tell us that's why they're there unless they're feeling bad and they've already had it established. It's usually something we notice and we say your blood pressure's high. You you probably should be checking it at home um, and keeping track of it. Um, we also have monitors where you can wear uh, or you can check things at home regularly. Um, our office has one that actually sends it to us automatically through the phone line to an RN that then sends me databases of numbers and various things. There's also ones you can you can wear. Those are a little harder to get uh, to get insurance to cover. However, those are the ones that supposedly give the most reliable, um, basis for whether or not your blood pressure is normal all the time. Because a lot of people will come in when they know it's high, but a lot of times you don't know when it's high. So anyway, and the jokes that probably nobody can read says, the humongo meal comes with your choice of two sides, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, or obesity. And next slide. So like uh, my dad was asking, most people are with hypertension are unaware um, because there are no warning signs or symptoms. Um, and for this reason, you, you just need to have it regularly checked. Your doctor usually will check it when you come in. Most providers' offices, your dentist, a lot of places will even check it 
just routinely, but there are machines in Walmart, other places like that. But the best way to check it is after you've been sitting quietly 10, 15 minutes, when you're resting, not right after you rushed in, not when you're angry watching news or, you know, <laughs> or even talking. Some people, their blood pressure goes up just by listening to them too. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, so, well, that's, you know, my blood pressure goes up a little bit just talking to some of my patients, but anyway. <laughs> So everybody's blood pressure should be checked. <laughs> All right, so, um, so the definition of hypertension, the next slide, here's some fancy numbers, um, which are hard to read as well. Um, I wasn't sure how big these things would be. Um, so there's a debate about what normal is because yes, it is a very subjective uh, number that they came up with for high blood pressure to be 140 over 90. And there's committees and all sorts of boards of people that, that change what is considered normal based on what your underlying medical conditions are. However, normal is between 100 and 120. That's normal, okay? That's where people are that don't need to be on medicines or don't need to actually change their lifestyle. And the studies have actually shown the lower you are, the less likely of all these complications of blood pressure progressing. To a point, exactly. So you don't, so you don't want to be dead and have zero over zero. Um, so that is a little too low. So that is true. Um, you know, if you're if you're so low to where you're passing out all the time, there are people that have that problem. But it's it can be because you're over medicated, but it can also be because of underlying conditions that cause you to be too low. So if you're feeling fine and your blood pressure is at 100 or 90 over 60, like Dad usually runs and you're feeling fine, then you know you're, you don't need to worry about it. It's not too low. If you're feeling fine and your brain is actually functioning and you're actually still getting blood flow to your kidneys and producing urine, then your, 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 blood, flow, your blood pressure's fine, even 90 over 60. It depends on if you got there, you know, yesterday you're 150 into the, you know, how quickly you get there and how long you've been there. So if that's your normal, that's your normal. If you've been there forever, that's, you're going to be fine there. Okay. Question. Yeah. Yes, that's still. Wouldn't, wouldn't the same increase from someone who has low, lower blood pressure? And that's, shouldn't that still be a red flag to your provider? Yes, and a, a lot. If you're seeing the same provider regularly, we usually have trends. At least I can see trends on my electronic medical chart of where your blood pressure has been over the past few years, and can look back and say, "Hey, this is new." Or I can look at your weight and say, "Hey, it's been creeping up, and that's probably why." Or I can look at you know, medications that you're on say, well, that's probably why you're on these medicines now that can cause things to be worse, or you've got this new medical condition that can make things worse. So it does vary. So normal um, in America is early death. Okay, so, so unfortunately normal, normal is not something that always is a good thing to try to attain to, okay? So the goal here today is to try to help you learn how to be better than normal and to try to, so I'm not trying to take the place of you st stopping meds, you know, so that's written on one of these things. The little disclaimer, do not stop your medicines. If you're, if you're on medicines, you need to let your doctors know, hey, I'm, I'm going to try some of these things. I'm going to try to improve my diet. I'm just letting you know, because if you do a lot better with some of these ways of improving your health, then you may be able to reduce or get off of medicines, but not without their assistance. And I don't want you ever going to your doctor and saying, Dr. Stone said uh, a, t a tablespoon of, of flaxine ground up every day is going to replace all my medicines. Okay. 
So I will tell them there in those, in those certain <laughs> words. Did I ever say that? Okay. So there are different levels of what's considered normal based on what your medical conditions are. So there are a lot of um, different agencies and different boards that will tell you different numbers. And yes, some doctors, that's what they were told. And we were also told years ago that as you age, your blood pressure goes up. And as an EMT, I was trained as an EMT at age 16 and it was 100 plus or age over diastolic. That's not true anymore either. So, you know, things do change and things change every day, unfortunately, in medicine and we can't keep up with everything. So we do go back and back and waffle quite a bit and we do the best we can with what knowledge we have, but nobody's perfect. And it's called practicing medicine for a reason. Like practicing law is practicing as well. We might get it right one day. So anyway, um, so blood pressure is based on different stages. So if you go in with your blood pressure of 140 or 90 and you're diabetic or have heart disease, they're going to say, you need to get this down 20, 30 points. And they're going to put you on multiple medicines. Okay. Um, so there's two main causes, uh, two main types, two main categories, essential, which is considered kind of primary blood pressure problems that as you age, things get worse and they're secondary. Something is actually causing it. So you're having high blood pressure secondary to sleep apnea or high blood pressure secondary to a tumor in your parathyroid gland. Or, you know, so primary is this, you know, where you have these age factors that, uh, that account for it as you gain weight. Um, that increases your risk for developing primary hypertension. Family history, if mom and dad both have hypertension, we're in trouble, okay? So we have a higher risk if both of your parents have um, high blood pressure. Race is important. Medications yeah, medication, um, actually, sometimes even what medications we start people on is is different based on how people respond based on race sometimes. So some people respond to certain classes of medicines different than others. Um, so reduced number of nephrons. So those are the little cells in your kidneys. Anything that re causes those to die off quicker, um, premature breath, genetics, uh, and acute kidney injury, like you get really dehydrated and you go into the hospital and there's a problem with your kidneys and it responds and improves over a few days, that because you had that previous insult, you don't get those cells back. So you're at a higher risk for having kidney issues down the road, okay? And it can just be a slow, gradual decline. So uh, high salt diets, American diet is very high in sodium. If you eat anything processed out of a package or a can, if you eat animal products, cheese, meat, breads are the highest foods in salt. As a baker, I can tell you, bread is nasty without salt. It is usually based on a percentage. Mine, I like math somewhat. So <laughs> baker's math, it's 2% of your, of your weight is salt. Um, so bread and depending on what kind of bread it is um, and how processed it is will determine the sodium content what about rice? do what what about, rice? what about it in terms of salt yes so it is also nasty if you don't have a little bit of salt <laughs> but uh in terms of you can actually change it quite a bit um, it, depending on how you cook it as to how much salt you add to it some places it is quite salty when you get it. In other places, it's a little minimal. Um, if you don't have salt in your rice, it is more gummy. Same thing with oats. A little bit of salt actually keeps things more flaky and keeps things the grain the grains so they separate a little easier. So it depends on really how you like your rice, um, but um, it's you can control the content unless you're getting out of the package and then you're kind of limited to however, whoever's cooking for you is adding it. All right, so excess alcohol consumption um, is definitely a high risk for high blood pressure, physical in inactivity. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a hard one for a lot of people, especially 
Nowadays, uh, I'm in a chair. My watch goes off nonstop telling me to get up and walk around, which some days, if I'm not seeing patients and I'm just doing administrative work, I don't get up for three hours. I mean, I look at it and I'm like, okay, I didn't even have time to get up. So it, it is, con it, you know, that you've heard of that being considered the new smoking. Sitting is the new smoking because it's a, it is a risk factor for actually causing health problems. Uh, all right. <laughs> we can walk around in a few minutes. All right. The next one says, your blood pressure is up. Quit taking campaign promises with a grain of salt. So how much salt? All right, that's a good, so I'm gonna use some videos from Dr. Greger because he actually says something's a little bit better than I can. So Marcy, if you wanna play uh, video one, if you can hear me, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through that. Maybe. <laughs> so usually the this quick answer is less than, um, 20, 2,500 milligrams a day is what's recommended. So that is quarter, I think I've got it on here, but she'll... High, High blood, blood pressure is the number one risk factor for death, death in the world, world affecting, affecting nearly 78 million Americans. Americans. Uh, that's, that's one, one in three, three adults. And, and as we age, your pressures get higher and higher, higher such that by age 60, it strikes, strikes more than half. Well, if it affects... Most of us, when okay, we get older, it? Uh, maybe, maybe it's less of the disease. the number one risk for death in the world, affecting nearly 78 million Americans. Uh, that's one in three adults. And as we age, your pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, it strikes more than half. Well, if it affects most of us, when we get older, uh, maybe it's less of the disease, or just an inevitable consequence of aging. No, we know since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Researchers measured the blood pressure of a thousand people in rural Kenya. We had the diet centered around whole plant foods, whole grains, beans, vegetables, fruit, and dark green leaves. Our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures actually go down. And the lower the better. The whole 140 over 90 cutoff is arbitrary. Even people who start out with blood pressures under 120 over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. If you went to your doctor with blood pressure 120 over 80, you get a gold star. But the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, makes me 110 over 70. 110 over 70. Is it even possible to get blood pressure down that low? It's not just possible. It's normal. For those eating healthy enough diets. For two years at Rural Kenyan Hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow, they must have low rates of heart disease. Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of arteriosclerosis. Our number one killer was found. Rural China, too. By 110 over 70, their entire lives, 70 year olds with the same average blood pressure as 16 year olds. Now, Africa, China, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common is that they were plant-based day-to-day with meat only eaten on special occasions. Now, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diets that was so protective? Because in the Western world, as the American Heart Association has pointed out, the only folks really getting it down that low were those eating strictly plant-based diets, coming in at about 110 over 65. This is the, the largest study of those eating plant-based diets. Today, 89,000 Californians uh, comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians, eating meat more on a weekly basis than a daily basis, compared to those who eat no meat except fish, uh, compared to those who eat no meat at all, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. Uh, now, now, this was an inventive study, so even the non-vegetarians didn't eat a lot of meat, and they tend to eat lots of fruits and vegetables and exercise and, you know, not smoke. And so even compared to a group of relatively healthy meat eaters, there appeared to be a stepwise drop in hypertension rates as people ate more and more plant-based. 
Same, Same thing with, with diabetes, diabetes and obesity. Uh, so, so yes, we can wipe out most of our risk eating strictly plant-based, but, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement along the spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant health benefits. You can show this experimentally. You take vegetarians, you give them meat and pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you remove meat from people's diets and blood pressures go down in just seven days. And this is after the vast majority reduced or stopped their blood pressure medications completely. Uh, they had to stop their medications once you treat the cause, once you eliminate the disease. You can't be on blood pressure pills with normal blood pressure. You can drop your pressure too low, get dizzy, fall over, hurt yourself. So your doctor has to pull you off the pills. Lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. So, uh, does the American Heart Association recommend a no meat diet? Uh, no, they recommend a low meat diet, so called DASH diet. Uh, why not completely plant-based? Uh, when the DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they were aware of the chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. Uh, see, the DASH diet was explicitly designed with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure or benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. Uh, they didn't think the public could handle the truth. Now, in their defense, you can see what they were thinking. I mean, just like drugs never work, unless you actually take them. Diets never work unless you actually eat them. So they're like, look, no one's going to eat strictly plant-based. So if they soft-pedaled the message and came up with some kind of compromised diet, then maybe on a population scale they'd do more good. Okay, tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. It, it is hard if you look at, a, if you're eating foods that have labels for one, it is hard to actually keep to that salt content. Most Americans eat about five to, t five to 10 times the amount of salt a day that's recommended. And the salt shaker accounts for usually less than 10%. So when people say, oh, I don't use salt, to, I don't add salt to my food. It's like, so <laughs> if, if you're eating these other foods, you're getting too much salt. Um, so the sodium content, you can look at the different salts. They're still all going to cause you to have problems with your blood pressure. So yes, you can look at the different types of salt and see what the sodium content is and, and try to figure out how much you can get to. But the goal is the lower, the better. When these, you know, usually when people have heart failure, it's get to less than two grams a day. And that's really struggling for most heart patients to get to that level. Um, that's the level they really recommend if you're eating plants and set of processed foods, that's usually the level you're, you're going to be at naturally because you're not going to be adding tons of salt to the things you eat just normally. Dad. Uh, salt is NaCl, right? Okay. Sodium chloride. There are other types. So you can look at different types like what she was asking about Himalayan salt. There are different types of table salt is sodium chloride. So yes, you can look at different types and figure out um, the sodium content of different salts. So it's, sodium it's sodium, so less than two grams of sodium, which is equivalent to less than three fourths of a teaspoon a day of table salt. So that's what that measurement's based on. Other other questions? Do you think it's a good time to talk about miso? Do, so miso, I didn't talk about in this, but miso, there are really good videos on this nutritionfacts.com org website so this website that michael gregor that this book where did i put the book um this website um she asked about miso and 
about the sodium content of miso. There are videos on this website that are actually really good about miso. Miso, despite it being high sodium amount, actually has been shown to reduce blood pressure because it is a very healthy fermented product. It's a soybean product that's fermented and it is actually shown to reduce people's blood pressure. Okay, so that's kind of the contradiction. So there is a paradox with miso. Um, so that's a plant-based um, product with, that's actually very good. Um, okay, so on to secondary types of, or secondary causes of blood pressure. So saying that something else is causing your blood pressure to be high, okay? So medications is a big category. Uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So if you take ibuprofen, Aleve, Motrin, BC powders, anything like that over the counter for any type A of headache, pain, it will cause your blood pressure to go up. It affects the blood supply to your kidneys. It temporarily, for however long that medicine's half-life is, will affect the blood supply to that organ and affect your blood pressure. Um, for some people, it's very small, and other people, it's, it's significant to where I take them off those medicines and say, nope, we cannot control your blood pressure. You've got to go to Tylenol instead, okay? So there's a large large category of medications that cause this, birth control pills, decongestant, weight loss medicines, um, over-the-counter antacids, especially things like Alka-Seltzer. People talk about Alka-Seltzer all the time and how they it's a cure-all for everything. It is not a cure-all for everything. Um, it causes significant issues. Stimulants, uh, meth, um, the medicines for ADHD, um, antipsychotics, illicit drugs. So a long, long list of problems here. Um, kidney disease, whether it's an acute or chronic issue. Um, so there's hormone conditions like the primary aldosteronism where there's the adrenal gland on top of your kidneys actually produces a hormone that causes your blood pressure to go up, okay? Uh, there's sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, a lot of people don't want to be tested for it and don't want to use the treatment for it. However, if you've got sleep apnea, um, usually you snore, you wake up tired, you wake up with headaches, um, you have to use caffeine or energy drinks or something to keep awake throughout the day. Um, your significant other may kick you or tell you you stop uh, breathing in the middle of the night. If any of those things occur, you need to get tested um, and you need to let your doctor know because unfortunately these things aren't things that we always just routinely say, oh, by the way, how are you sleeping? You know, do you snore? Does your, if your significant other does not come with you to the appointment, you often will not hear about it. <laughs> so, um, so those are things where you may need to get a sleep study because if you have an underlying condition like obstru obstructive sleep apnea, it, when you try to sleep at night, your oxygen, air, um, your oxygen levels drop as those airways are closing and being blocked. And that increases risk for strokes, heart attacks, arrhythmias, even death. So that is one of those conditions that, you know, when we see young patients coming in with blood pressure, um, that's one thing I always say, okay, how are you sleeping? Uh, do you snore? Do they complain about you snoring? Do they tell you you... Do they poke you in the ribs and say, you know, take a breath? Do you, do you uh, uh, choke in the middle of the night or wake up coughing and hacking um, and trying to get your breath? Um, if so, you need a sleep study. And the treatment is a mask or a little nasal pillow that you wear that forces the airways to stay open and your oxygen levels to stay normal. And it takes getting used to. So most people fight with it until they succumb and give in and then, then they actually start feeling better and start saying, I, I never felt so good. I will never be without this again. Um, but it is a struggle to get used to it. What we usually tell people is um, wear the mask while you're watching TV and while you're sitting, reading, doing other things and get used to having it on your face before you try to lay down and go to sleep. So get used to it. Um, yes. One of the things now is with many smartwatches, you're able to track your oxygen content. Yes. As long as you wear your watch to the bed, so that also maybe that be an early warning indicator. That yeah. You 
Yeah, especially if you don't have somebody poking you or if they or if they have the same condition, they will not poke you. Uh, uh, if, if, they, if they put in hearing aids or put in, you know, earplugs or other things to drown you out, they're not going to be telling you. Um, so, yes. So smart watches, if you wear them at night, I don't wear mine at night because I have to charge it. So it's kind of like, well, I don't know if I, <laughs> you know. So that's, that's the issue with that is you can't charge it as easily. Um, so a few other conditions. These are mainly endocrine conditions. Uh, most of these other things, some of them you found early. Some things you really are hard to find. Um, hyperparathyroidism is hard to find, and it is very subtle, and it is not something people look for. So it is something that you really have to have. Um, uh, you have to be looking for it to find it. I'll put it that way. Okay, so what are the complications of high blood pressure? This chart, uh, this next, is very hard for you all to see, so I'm going to tell you some of the main ones. Uh, so complications of high blood pressure, aneurysms, dementia, problems with memory and understanding, uh, bleeding in the eyes, sleep apnea, blurred vision, arrhythmias, chest pain, kidney failure, left, left ventricular hypertrophy, where the left side of your heart gets too big and the muscle gets enlarged, heart attack or stroke, heart failure, erectile dysfunction, lower sexual desire, osteoporosis, blood clots, hardening of the arteries, and artery damage. These are all very common complications of high blood pressure that you may not know you even have. Okay. Um, any questions on that? Okay. So the main treatment the first and foremost that we always tell patients that nobody likes to hear is diet, exercise, cut back on these foods that you're eating, cut back on fast food. Nobody tends to like to hear that. And they, at least in my office, they always say, and what are you going to give me for it? Um, there are lots of medicines. All medicines have side effects, all of them. Sunlight has side effects. Water has side effects. Aspirin has side effects. Everything has side effects, unfortunately. So the goal is to have the least amount of side effects as possible. And at least that's my goal when I see patients is to try to keep them off of medicines. Um, and I have to ask myself and ask them sometimes, what is your goal? Because most of the time it's, I want a pill. What are you going to give me to get this down? Because I have to pass this physical for... DOT or, or I have whatever reason. Um, medications, there are eight different classes of medicines. And once you get started on medicine, most doctors just go down the line and start adding more and more and more. Um, there are ways for you to take control of your health and to try to reduce the amount of medicines. But it does take quite a bit of work. It is not easy to be healthy ever, okay? So the main things with the non-pharmacologic therapies that we're gonna talk about briefly, uh, the next slide, I don't think you need to know about all the classes because you probably already know some of them if you're on blood pressure medicines, but they all have side effects. They all have different things that we have to monitor with labs and various things, but the non-pharmacologic therapy is what we're gonna try to work on with this series in terms of how to help you not die by not increasing your risks. So it's kind of a way word rare to put that. So the one thing we talked about before is sodium content, cutting back to less than three fourths teaspoon per day. You want to start reading labels. So if, if foods have labels on them, then you need to be looking at them. The foods that don't have labels on them are usually the things you want to be eating. So the things around the perimeter of the grocery store that don't have labels like peppers and bananas, they don't tell you how many milligrams of, of sodium or what their calorie content is. If they don't have a label, they're usually the things you want to eat more of, okay? Um, so this little joke says, oh, I guess you probably can read that one. It's probably big enough. Take it with a grain of salt and he took it literally and he dissolved into a little puddle of liquid. All right, so some of the other things you can do uh, non-medicine wise are to increase potassium intake. So potassium 
counters sodium. So there's these little transport things in your body and your cells that if you use more potassium, it pretends, prevents the sodium from being put into your cell. So the things that are really high in potassium are not bananas. And that's not usually even on the top thousand list of foods high in potassium. The top two are beans and grains. So whole, whole, so dried beans, not, not uh, gummy beans or uh, jelly beans, not, not green beans. Green, green beans are considered a vegetable. They are not considered a legume. So I'm talking about legumes. Okay. There are thousands of varieties of legumes, split peas, lentils, dried beans. Okay. Beans and greens in the South. Beans and greens is what's going to help you the most. Okay. Uh, the other things, weight loss, exercise, limiting alcohol. And then um, we're going to do the food specific ones here. And I'm going to have her play the next video here real quick. Video number two. And then we'll talk about some other food options. The most comprehensive and systematic analysis of causes of death ever undertaken allows us to answer questions like, how many lives could we save if people cut back on soda? The answer, our best estimate, 299,521. Soda isn't just bad because it's empty calories, so it's not a health-promoting food. It appears to be an actively death-promoting food. Of course, not as deadly as bacon, bologna, ham, hot dogs. 800,000 deaths every year, killing twice as many women than domestic violence. Uh, five times more people than all illegal drugs combined. But eating more whole grains could save 1.7 million lives every year. More vegetables, 1.8 million lives. If only we ate more nuts and seeds, 2.5 million lives saved. But fruit. It's apparently what the world needs most. They didn't look at beans. 4.9 million lives hang in the balance every year. And the cure is not drugs or vaccines. The cure is fruit. One reason why plant-based diets can save so many millions is because the number one killer risk factor in the world is high blood pressure, laying to waste 9 million people year after year. In the United States, high blood pressure affects nearly 78 million. That's one in three of us. And as we age, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60 it strikes more than half. If it affects most of us when we get older, maybe it's less a disease and more just a natural inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known for nearly a century that high blood pressure need never occur. Researchers measured the blood pressures of 1,000 people in rural Kenya a way to diet centered around whole plant foods, whole grains, beans, vegetables, fruit, dark green leafies. Up until age 40, the blood pressures of rural Africans was about the same as Europeans and Americans, down around 120s over 80s. But as Westerners age, their pressures creep up, such that by age 60, the average person may be hypertensive, exceeding 140 over 90. But what about those not following the Western diet? Their pressures improved with age. Not only did they not develop hypertension, their blood pressures actually got better. The whole uh, 140 over 90 cutoff is arbitrary. Just like studies show that the lower the cholesterol, the better. Right? There's really no safe cholesterol level above about 150. Blood pressure studies also support the kind of lower the better approach to blood pressure reduction. Even people who start out with blood pressure under 120 over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. Uh, but is it possible to get blood pressures under 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. Over two years at a rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow, so they must have had you know, low rates of heart disease. No, they had no rates of heart disease. Not low risk, no risk. Not a single case of arteriosclerosis, our number one killer, was found.
of how many servings a day you should have of grains. So whole grains are things that are considered unprocessed. So the difference between refined grains and whole grains tend to be factory. So how things come out of the, the garden out of, when they're grown, that's the whole grain. So whole grain corn um, is usually dried. It's hard. You make cornbread from it. Um, then there's rice, oats, barley, farro, quinoa. Uh, there's a whole heck of a lot of grains. Um, there's lots of different varieties of grains. I mean, just oats up here. So this is just an example of, this is an intact grain. So things like that come from the, the field is considered an intact grain if it's got the whole, whole growth. So whole intact grains actually are known for helping your GI tract and what's called the microbiome in your GI tract. The, the less processed things are, the better. So oat groats, these take about an hour to cook. As they become processed, they, be, they are quicker and quicker to cook. So if you get old fashioned oatmeal, uh, it is processed, it's steamed and then stamped flattened into a flake. So it's processed with steam a couple times. Uh, still cut oats are an oat groat that's been chopped. Irish oats are ones that have been milled. Um, so it's more creamy. Quick oats are these just chopped up a few times. Then you've got instant oats that are really not a food class. <laughs> They're kind of the junk category. They are pre-cooked and lots of other additives to it. So those, so, you know, they go, the longer things take to cook, usually the healthier they are for you, which for me, the way I do it once a week, I usually bake these. Amazon. <laughs> Bob's mill has some, um, if you can get them in, we used to be able to get them in the, in the co-op. Does co-op still have them? So they used to have them in the bulk bins. So, but I get most things from Amazon because I can get it cheaper in bigger bulk things. Because I usually, my house has grains uh, in big jars all along the counter. So lots of different types of wheat. There's lots of different, there's not too many different varieties of oats, but there are like barley. Uh, there are multiple different types of barley. You can get purple barley, you can get black barley. Things with pigments have more, an, more um, antioxidants, but there's a chemical name that I was saying to think that I can't think of, but that's it. They have more of those. Thanks, Mom. So, uh, so you know, black quinoa, uh, red quinoa, um, those will have a little bit more of those phytochemicals than white quinoa. But white quinoa, is that the only thing you can get? Get white quinoa, okay? So... Whole grains, um, what I usually tell patients is three to four servings a day is what's recommended. Um, some people will say, eat as much as you can. Others will say, as long as you're getting some, so take it for what it's worth. Three to four is what I usually tell patients. That's what the pyramid used to be based on, and then they changed it to a daily, into a plate with quadrants. The, uh, since we don't have food pyramids anymore, the USDA, change things. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, whole grains, whole grains are actually very good for you. So if you combine a whole grain and a bean, a split pea or lentil, a grain and a bean is actually the staple of most continents. So there's beans and rice for South America and other areas. There's rice and tofu or vegetables for Asian countries. Uh, India, it's dal, which is lentils, uh, and rice, and curried beans. So, if you you know, beans and rice is really, you can eat that for breakfast. You don't have to eat, like, junk for breakfast. It can be, like, real food. <laughs> Do what? Brown. Brown versus right, white. So, white, white rice is considered definitely a refined grain. So, that's where the bran has been taken off of it. So it cooks a lot quicker. You can actually get things that are pre-cooked. So you just, they're instant. So you, you know, those packages of like Uncle Ben's that's 10 minutes, it's been pre-cooked for you. Um, 
So the more you cook things up front, the, the, uh, the more nutrients you're going to have, okay, instead of losing them. Um, so, so grains we talked about, flaxseed. Flaxseed is, is actually a very interesting um, seed. So when, when you take these whole, um, you don't actually get the omega-3s from them. So they pass through you um, whole through your GI tract and they will help you with your GI issues, but they will not give you the omega-3s. If you actually want to get the omega-3s, you need to grind them. And that's what a nice little coffee grinder here is for. So I use it for spices. So what's actually recommended is a tablespoon of this every day. Grind it up, put it on whatever, or make something with it. These usually, once you grind them, they're usually good for about a month. Um, but the closer to when, you know, if you have one of these and can do it every day before you put it on your cereal or do whatever you're making with it, um, you'll get more of the nutrients. So things do kind of go, go down as you let them sit. And if you get it already pre-ground, uh, you might want to smell it. It's probably been on the shelf for a while. You can look at the dates on some things. They do go rancid and Flaxseed oil is not the same. So flaxseed oil is a very processed item. It's got to be kept in a dark container um, so it doesn't oxidize. It looks like uh, olive oil, but it is a cold pressed, but it is not the same. And it's not, it's still a very processed. It's not a natural food. So foods, as opposed to things that come in a bottle are better for, better for you. Okay. So one tablespoon of this a day, they've done studies for blood pressure. Um, this is equivalent, actually better. They, one, one tablespoon a day has been shown to be better for blood pressure than two blood pressure pills together. So the study that they did, it was an uh, average of 15 over 8 reduction, and that's better than two main classes of blood pressure pills. That's why we start multiple at once usually with blood pressure pills if people are so high on their blood pressure. So this is a pretty easy thing to do to improve your health and there's no bad side effects. There's only good stuff. Yeah. So is that the same thing as like when somebody takes like an omega-3 still? Like no. Like no. Like so, so no. So, so cod liver oil and omega-3 pills you might want to check and make sure it's not a fish source. So fish get it from algae. Okay, so the algal sources, they eat plants. So fish eat plants and then we eat them and then we get our plants secondhand through them. So if you want to go straight to the source for omega-3 fatty acids, you go to kale, flaxseed, chia seeds, hemp seeds, and walnuts. There's actually a really good... Uh, uh, Dr. Neil Nedley has a cookbook um, where he actually makes a omega-3 topping that a tablespoon a day gives you about what you need. Uh, it is actually very tasty. It is, it is flaxseed, chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, date sugar, which is just dried dates that are ground up, and a pinch of salt. And then you mix that all together, and I put it on toast with jam or on berries. I use it on berries every day because I have a, I eat a bowl of berries every day for breakfast. Um, and either put this on there or that omega-3 topping that I make. If you um, wash some of the flaxseed that are refrigerated, you know how long that would last? About a month. That's it. Yeah. If you put that same piece on a croissant, would that continue? So, <laughs> so, so the butter negates the, the effect. So the butter... <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> All right. So the, the, any other questions on that? My club. Uh, that's not on the, on this list, but <laughs> he's talking about my bean club. I'm part of a bean club, a dried bean club. Yeah. Rancho Gordo <laughs> beans. Anyway. So greens and beans, that was back to that one, but, the dried beans, that's why I know so much of beans. I have lots of beans at my house, <laughs> lots of different varieties, probably over 30 varieties of beans or more at my house from all over. 
Um, and that's not even a drop in the bucket of how many there are. <laughs> yes. Yes. I do. My dad, the woodworker. Okay. So um, the next one is hibiscus tea. So hibiscus tea is also one of those things that is, you can actually get just the flowers and make your own, you know, loose tea, or you can get tea bags. Um, hibiscus tea is one of those healthy things to drink. Um, the caveat is rinsing your mouth out afterwards because it can affect your enamel of your teeth and not to drink more than a, a quart a day. But that one's been shown, if you drink three cups a day, and that means strong tea, they usually say five bags for three cups worth of liquid uh, to get you that six point. That's how they did the study, to get six point drop on your blood pressure. Okay. Um, any questions on hibiscus tea? It uh, can make it a little soft, uh, but I don't think it discolors it. It just makes it a little soft, and it says to make sure to just rinse out your mouth. It's like lemon juice. So it's really tart. So that's why they say, like, with lemon juice, you know, rinse out your mouth afterwards because your enamel on your teeth can be affected. Um, other questions? Um, the next one is nitric oxide. So beets and greens again. So beans, not beans, greens. <laughs> I have beans on my mind. Greens. Um, so kale, turnip greens, spin, uh, spinach, uh, chard. chard <laughs> You're right. Yes, romaine does count as a green. Yes. A powder? It's better than nothing, but unfortunately, like those uh, supplements that where you can get a vitamin pill or a fruit juice pill or those type of things, yeah, you're usually wasting your money. So, so it may be better. It may be better than nothing. There are some things that you can get. <laughs> there are some things that you can get that uh, are helpful for antioxidants like amla powder, things like those. But in terms of beet green powders, or I would get it from the source. And really, two servings. So for vegetables, it's recommended you eat nine to 12 servings of vegetables a day, OK? With two of those servings being a green leafy vegetable. Those bags in the store of, veg, of uh, salad mix, that's two servings for one person for one day. That is like 50 calories. These are like the, the most nutritious things you can eat is basically like kale and these greens. But you also don't want to go hog wild and eat nothing but kale because that can actually impair your thyroid function. So there were people that will eat more than, you know, 40, 40 cups of kale a day and had problems with their, you know. So moderation, diversity, the goal is actually to get a rainbow of colors of fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, seeds, nuts. Okay. You don't, you want to aim for more than 30 different foods, plants a week, ideally a day, but a week would be better than the standard American diet. Okay. Um, beets, beets are extremely good for you. They've actually done, um, had people drink beet juice, which is basically or eating a can's worth of beets. And, and that has been shown to be very helpful for blood pressure as well. And, and beets are so canned beets are, are okay. Are better than the yeah. <laughs> Save your money, John. <laughs> so, so you're dehydrating it where, so foods that get dehydrated do lose a lot of their moisture and they lose a lot of their nu nutrients. So things do kind of degrade over a period of time. So that's why, that's why fresh is, you know, fresh is the best. If you can get fresh foods, frozen is the next best. And sometimes those actually taste better because they usually are flash frozen in the field. And yeah. Uh, so frozen beets. Good luck finding frozen beets. <laughs> you can find them someplace. Canned is like the last. Yeah. So, you know, fruits. Fruits, um, you know, like uh, dried fruits would probably be 
down on the bottom as well. They're very high. They get concentrated in their sugars. They really will affect your sugar levels and spike your sugars. Um, fruit juices will definitely spike your sugars just like a Coke will. Um, so fruit juices are not a health food either. Um, the whole fruit, fruit is. So the whole fruit, when you have the fiber in it, delays that spike in your sugars. So, so um, these talks, and we're going to have a, another video, and then we'll go through and start going through some of these daily dozen that we're going to start talking about on these in these meetings. We, yeah, number three. During, During his, his career at Duke, Dr. Kempner treated more than 18,000 patients with his rice diet, which was originally designed as a treatment for kidney failure and out-of-control high blood pressure at a time when those diagnoses were like a death sentence. Patients who at that time would have died in all other hospitals had a reasonable chance of survival if they came under Kempner's care. The results were so dramatic that many experienced physicians suspected him of falsifying data, because he was reversing terminal diseases with rice and fruit, diseases understood to be incurable by the best of modern medicine at the time. Intensive investigations into his clinic vindicated his work, which other researchers were then able to replicate. Kempner was criticized for his lack of controls, meaning that when patients came to him, he didn't randomly allocate half to his rice treatment and put the other half on conventional therapy to see which group did better. Kempner argued that the patients each acted as their own controls. Uh, for example, here's a patient before the rice diet. The medical profession threw everything they had at him, and his blood pressures were still as high as 220 over 160, whereas normal is considered more like around uh, 120 over 80 which is where the rice diet took him. Had he not been given the rice diet, it's true his pressures might have been even lower, zero over zero, because he'd likely be dead. The quote-unquote control group in Kempner's day had a survival expectancy estimated at six months. To randomize patients to conventional care would be to randomize them to their deaths. One can compare those who stuck to the diet, though, to those who didn't. Uh, here's a chart showing the survival of uh, 70 of the kind of sickest of the sick that showed up at their clinic. Of those that started the rice diet but then stopped it within a year, five lived and 19 ended up dead. For those who made it a year but then gave up on the diet, instead of an 80% chance of dying, uh, they had more like a 50-50 flip of the coin. But of those that stuck with the program, 90% lived to tell the tale. Beginning in the 1950s, drugs became available that effectively reduced blood pressure in hypertension, leading to a decreased demand for the rice diet. What conclusions can we draw from this all-but-forgotten therapy for hypertension? Not only was it the first effective therapy for high blood pressure, it may be equal to or more effective than our current multi-drug treatments. This causes one to speculate on the current practice of placing patients on one drug, then another, perhaps a third, until the blood pressure is controlled, with lip service advocacy of moderate reduction in dietary sodium, fat, and protein intake, while the impressive effectiveness of the rice-fruit diet, which is able to quickly stop the leakage from our arteries, and uh, lower increased intracranial pressure, reduce heart size, reverse the EKG changes, reverse heart failure, reduce weight, and markedly improve diabetes is ignored. So should we return to the Kempner protocol of starting with the most effective therapy, saving drugs for patients who fail to respond, or who are unable or unwilling to restrict their diet? Look, today many people follow a vegetarian diet as a choice, which is similar to what Kempner was a, often able to transition people to. After their high blood pressure was cured by the rice diet, patients were often able to gradually transition to a less strenuous dietary regime uh, without added medications and with no return of the elevated blood pressure. So if the Kempner sequence of a strictest of a strict plant-based diet to a more sane plant-based di type diet 
offers the quickest and best approach to effective therapy, why isn't it still in greater use? The powerful role of the pharmaceutical industry in steering medical care away from dietary treatment to medications should be noted. Who profits from dietary treatment? Who, who provides the support for investigation and the funds for clinical trials? There is more to overcome than just the patient's reluctance to change their diet. What Kempton wrote to a patient in 1954 uh, was as true then as it is now, 60 years later. Drugs can be very useful, properly employed, and used in conjunction with intensive dietary treatment. However, high blood pressure, with all its possible complications— heart disease, kidney disease, stroke, blindness— is still treated very casually, a striking contrast to the attitude towards other diseases like cancer. Since patients, physicians, and the chemical industry prefer the taking, prescribing, and selling of drugs to dietary treatment, inconvenient to patient and physician, and of no benefit to the pharmaceutical industry, the mortality figures for these diseases will still remain rather appalling. Despite hundreds of drugs on the market now, high blood pressure remains the number one cause of death and disability in the world, killing off 9 million people a year, and diet treats the underlying cause. As Dr. Kempner explained to a patient, look, if you should find a heap of manure on your living room floor, I do not recommend that you go buy some air freshener and perfume. I recommend you get a bucket and a shovel and a strong scrubbing brush. Then, then when your living room floor is clean again, then fine. Feel free to freshen things up once the underlying cause has been removed. As the great physician Maimonides said about 800 years ago, any illness that can be treated by diet alone should be treated by no other means. the drug companies uh, because your doctors are not really trained to tell you about flaxseed they're trained to tell you about drugs okay and to put you on more and more medicines um, it is in your benefit to control your destiny <laughs> for your health based on what you want to do uh, some people just want to take a pill they don't have time I mean, time is a big factor when you're trying to be healthy. It, it takes a lot of effort to be healthy, but it's either doing it now or paying for it later. Um, so it's, you know, the goal, the goal is not to how not to die because everybody's going to die, okay? But the goal is to not speed it up. Okay? How to learn to slow things down and to where you end up uh, not being in a nursing home for the last 10 years, but you know, may be able to stay in your home until you die in your sleep. You know, there are different levels of some, you know, I have patients that tell me I've already made it to 60. I don't care what happens now because I never thought I'd live it this long. So who cares? Uh, we have a better hope than a lot of other people. Um, and we have a lot more to offer. Um, you know, they quote the Avenus studies all the time on his book quotes Avenus studies he doesn't say it right he says adventist but anyway you know they quote loma linda studies all the time um, we have a lot of the information but unfortunately time and life gets in the way and it is a challenge for everyone so the foods that really are known for healing you are plants the more plants you eat, the better. Even if you don't give up all the other stuff, because I'm guilty of making cakes that, you know, can probably kill you as well. Um, you know, so you, you have to, you have to, you know, eat that with a, 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 a big plate of kale salad. Okay, so anyway, so 
you know, the, the goal is to eat as much of the plants as possible. So the recommendations, 9 to 12 servings of fruit a day, 9 to 12 servings of vegetables a day, with two of those being green leafy vegetables, 3 to 4 servings of beans, split peas, or lentils, dried beans, split peas, or lentils. Green beans count as a vegetable. One serving of seeds, nuts, seeds or nuts, or, or seed or nut butter, one serving a day. If you're trying to lose weight, those are the things you usually want to steer away from as much as you can. Uh, one tablespoon is not enough to cover a piece of bread for me of peanut butter, uh, but that is one serving, okay? Uh, uh, seeds, it's usually, they'll tell you how, how much you're on there, but I've got a little hand, I've got a couple of handouts where the daily, Gregor's daily dozen are things that he recommends that you eat every day. Uh, as, and his even are a little different than what I tell patients too, because I get things from multiple different sources. Uh, so this I've got as a handout for you that you can take home. But today we were talking mainly about flaxseed for this, but I, I was wanting to pair some of these foods with our different talks on diabetes, depression, because certain foods will be better for certain things, but they're good for everything to begin with. So, <laughs> you know, you had a question? Yeah, so that's Yeah. So do you recommend like kind of a day or a day, or how do you get all of these serving? So that is a challenge for, so if you are eating a full plant-based diet and you're not eating processed foods or any other things in your diet, you're gonna be eating a lot more food than any other diet plans out there, okay? Um, you can usually eat as much foods like greens and, and fruits and, and vegetables, and you're looking at calorie density then as well. Uh, so foods that are really calorie dense are going to fill you up quicker. You, like, you know, like I was saying, the bag of salad, 50 calories for that, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to get obese eating too much kale. Okay. But if you took a highly processed food like oil, like olive oil, uh, where you sit with a loaf of bread at Bella Note and you go through half a bottle of, you know, olive oil like I do sometimes, then, you know, you, you kind of, that's a very high, high density, ca high calorie dense food that is going to cause you some problems. So that's a highly processed food. So oil, the less oil you use, the better. In fact, no oil is what's usually recommended, low salt, low sugar. Uh, those are very hard for a lot of people that like food to follow, <laughs> and I'm aware of it. There are, there, it is easier to cut back on oil than for me, at least on salt. Salt is like, ah, I have to have salt. But, you know, um, those foods and, and these, you know, some of the things are very easy to get, like the servings of berries. I mean, four, five strawberries being a serving, like I don't eat just five berries uh, when I eat berries. Um, one apple, if it's a good size apple, that's two servings. Regular banana, it's two servings. So if you're talking about three servings per meal, you're talking about a piece and a half of fruit or a bowl of berries or get them two meals or, you know, so the studies have actually shown, depending on if you're trying to, if you're trying to lose weight or uh, give your gut a, a rest, they do not recommend you graze nonstop and have multiple little meals. That's actually been shown to be not helpful for weight loss. And that keeps your GI tract constantly working and you not resting. So the, you know, some GI specialists will actually recommend that you um, eat two big meals within an eight hour period and let your bowels rest for 16 hours a day. Um, especially if you have irritable bowel syndrome or a lot of indigestion issues, that's what's recommended. Um, so big breakfast, good sized lunch, and then nothing until you break your fast the next morning. If you're really starving, piece of fruit. You know, water, um, you wanna be drinking plenty of water as well. Um, so I've got handouts, these videos, um, I've got handouts on hypertension specific ones that we talked about, the flaxseed, 
some other videos that are on here that I wish you could just click on, but unfortunately I couldn't get QR, I couldn't figure out how to do QR codes. So if you want to pass those out and then the daily dozen ones, um, we'll go through real quick, but you know, beans, berries, other fruits, cruciferous vegetables, greens. These are the things he recommends daily. He actually has an app. So if you like to look, check little boxes, they're on there. You can get an app that where you can actually, it will tell you what the serving sizes are of everything. Um, whether you have scale, you know, and you can, I have a scale cause I bake too much. Um, so I have a scale and I can tell how many grams, you know, is stuff and oh yeah. Cruciferous and broccoli, cauliflower, arugula is considered a cruciferous, Brussels sprouts. I'm pretty sure arugula. Cabbage, yeah. Um, and then the other other vegetables like squash, dried mushrooms, vegetable juice. So you can count some of these things like your V8 juice, you can count as a vegetable serving. Um, spices are on here, so turmeric, non-salt spices like uh, garlic salt, um, is that garlic salt, garlic powder. Um, uh, don't add salt. Uh, yeah, anyway, turmeric, the thing with turmeric to make it more active, uh, a little crack of black pepper will actually make turmeric um, antioxidants more um, effective. Um, so black pepper actually makes turmeric uh, more of a, the anti-inflammatory effect pronounced. Not that I know of, not that I've ever heard. Ginger is an anti-inflammatory as well. Okay. Um, so you can actually get turmeric spices, is what I usually recommend, as opposed to capsules. You will save a lot of money. You can actually get little capsule stuffers <laughs> where you make your own. It, would, it saves you money, and you actually you can actually get a bag of turmeric from an Indian store for like 2 or $3, as opposed to the little... McCormick's or whatever at the store that will be like six or seven dollars for you know this amount. Um, anyway, Amazon. So you can get you can actually get you can actually get pill stuffers and make your own. So yeah, so you can get the capsules. You can get vegetarian capsules, so they're not they're not glycerin, they're not uh, uh, gelatin based. So you can actually get capsules and so some of the other anti-inflammatory type things, amla, which is dry gooseberry. That is one that's, it's a food. If you can get Indian gooseberries here, I don't know where you shop, but, uh, but you can get the dried powder. And that was one that really does help with your immunity. Um, it's one of the highest antioxidant berries you can, you can get, but you can get dried amla powder. Um, it's nasty. That's why you put it in a pill and you swallow it because <laughs> otherwise it is very bitter. Um, so those little capsules, you can get them and, and then you know what's going in the capsule and you're not just paying for some filler because supplements, they can sell you anything. Um, there is no regulation over supplements whatsoever. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. They can sell you dirt from their backyard and claim that it's turmeric and it can have all sorts of allergens in it. It can interact with all sorts of prescription meds you're on. Um, yeah, I'm not one that usually recommends too many vitamins, herbals. I usually tell you to find the source. You know, like if you're low in magnesium, look up foods that are high in magnesium and eat those, like almonds. <laughs> okay, uh, you had a question? So, how much of the powder did you know? So, um, we'll talk about some of those. So, AMLA is a, so this, for turmeric, it's a quarter teaspoon. And the little pill, the little capsules, you can either get quarter teaspoon ones or, or half teaspoon ones. And it's a little, it's a little device like this that you put a little capsule in and then you pour the stuff into them and tap them down and, and then put the top on and then you swallow it. Actually pretty easy, but it takes some time. So, um, 
that's just another way of doing things yourself and knowing what you're ingesting as opposed to buying a supplement. Because you can you can buy turmeric supplements. You can buy you can probably buy AMLA capsules. I'm betting it's A M L A, the Indian gooseberries. Um, however, you can get a bag of the stuff and do it yourself and probably save you a lot of money and know what's going to be in it because you're doing it. So you can do that with spices. If you don't like the taste of garlic powder, you can do that with spices. But those type of things are actually really good anti-inflammatory. And if you're not eating Italian every day where you want garlic on everything, then you might get a pill. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So when you eat curry, like the, when I make curry, it usually has turmeric in it. Um, I'm probably getting not a, a, tea, a quarter teaspoon a day if in the amount that I eat. But if you're eating curry and other things that have those spices in them naturally, then yes, you're you're usually getting it in a good amount. Um, onions, you you know, regardless of how you cook onions, they usually still have their benefits to you as well as garlic. Um, so those are things that you want to. You want to eat. You want to use natural um, foods as much as you can in a wide variety, and those count as your diversity as well. I mean, there are lots of different types of onions, types of different garlic. So when you're taking turmeric supplements or like that amla, uh -huh. you mentioned, is it better for women because they have like a fatty thing with it, like like from almond? So it's not a fat-soluble vitamin like vitamin D or those type of things where you need to have a fat. Um, you know, something fatty to eat with it, so it does not matter. But the turmeric is one where a crack of black pepper really pronounces it. So like turmeric I use when I make, I make scrambled tofu now. So I went plant-based a few years ago, and scrambled tofu she, my mom had made before I went plant-based, and I didn't like it until after. <laughs> and now I eat it all the time. And it gets quite a bit of turmeric, um, and it gets black pepper, and it gets Bragg's amino acids, and I can eat that pretty regularly. Um, so, anyway, other questions? What do you think of seaweed? It's good for you. Yeah, I don't like the taste of it, but it is good for you. Is it developed or is it To salt? Um, yes, there are a lot of benefits with seaweed and sea and sea uh, what uh, vegetables um, where you can eat sea vegetables. And you were asking about miso. Miso is one of those high salt condiments. It's a fermented soybean, and it has been shown to actually lower your blood pressure to, to ingest miso, even though it is so, so it is considered a paradoxical type of food. <laughs> hmm. Things no <laughs> things that make you go home. Um, <laughs> things that look good for you are not always bad. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, bad for you. Um, I don't know too many other paradoxical ones. There's actually a video on miso on this website as well about the paradox of it. So it's actually pretty good. So did everybody get both both handouts? Did I pass out both? Okay. Any other questions? Did we go through everything? I think we went through everything.